Beyond Groom Lake is Papoose Lake, Area S4, alleged home of a flying saucer base. Bob Lazar, jet car builder, former employee of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, the birthplace of the atomic bomb, and supposedly hired as an engineer on a top secret project. I was under the impression I was going to be working on an advanced propulsion system, which was right up my alley, and I was very excited about it. And I was, I was led to believe it was going to be some sort of field propulsion system, which, in fact, it was, but I had no idea of the uh, <laughs> implications of what they were talking about. Lazar says he was flown from Las Vegas to Groom Lake, put on a bus, and driven to Area S4, Papoose Lake. We drove up, the hangar door was open and there was a flying saucer. I got out, was led purposely through it, and I was told to keep my eyes forward and walk straight, and it was kind of a mental torture because it was a fantastically interesting thing here, but I was under the impression that this was something that we had developed, and in fact, I remember even laughing to myself that this answers all the ridiculous UFO sightings. We have been making these things all along, test flying them, and everyone's been thinking they're flying saucers from another planet. And I thought, wow, this is, this is great. In fact, they even had a little American flag stuck on the side of it, which I thought was a nice touch. Bob soon discovered that the saucer was of alien origin. It was still some time later that I was actually let inside it, and it became extremely obvious that this was something we didn't make because only then, after seeing how small everything was inside, that it was obviously never made to, to hold a, a human. And they basically came clean with what we're doing is back engineering this because we want to find out how it was made. And that pretty much says <laughs> it wasn't made here. The disc itself was on three levels. The upper level, which I never got to go on the middle one where you enter, and then there's a lower one where the gravity amplifiers hang down and you can have access to the bottom part of the craft. It's a very eerie feeling to be in there. Um, there are no obvious control panels or switches. The only thing sticking up out of the ground were three chairs, uh, the reactor itself, and the actual gravity amplifiers. And underneath them were the other components to the propulsion system, but that's about all that was in there. Bob Lazar has been investigated by a reporter at the local TV station. What some have called the Cosmic Watergate. There had been stories about Dreamland floating around in Nevada for a number of years. Little bits and pieces in the newspaper, references to secret programs, occasionally a reference to alien technology. There have been some of those same kind of references in ufological circles. People saying, there's a secret base in Nevada, you better check this kind of a thing out. Uh, it wasn't until about 1987 I started digging into some of these things. In 1989, I met Robert Lazar, and, uh, and the story he told me was an incredible one by any standards. I thought that if, in fact, any of this stuff checks out, it may be the biggest story in history. Does Lazar's story check out? Do any records of Lazar's past employment exist? For myself and the TV station, the, the key to his credibility, the key to his story was always Los Alamos. Because if he worked at Los Alamos, if he worked in classified projects, it is at least conceivable that he would have been brought to Nevada to work in other classified projects. As a test on his uh, veracity, we wanted to go to Los Alamos and, and have him show us around. He said, I can get you in. I said, yeah, we'll believe this when we see it. So we were there on a weekend fewer people are in the lab, and, and Bob, in fact, did take us in. And it was like uh, following him through this labyrinth of uh, different labs and facilities, and he knew his way around like, like a rabbit in its own burrow. He knew where everything was, and, and, uh, and that impressed me, because how would he know if he hadn't been there? Los Alamos was uncooperative from the first day. Years and years went by, and I still couldn't get any confirmation from them that Bob had ever worked there. It makes no sense they'd have no records on someone who worked there just a few years before, but that's what they were telling me. Now, I had interviewed other people that worked with Bob there who say that he was an employee, he was a physicist, and he worked in classified projects. If that were the case, where are the records? Because to this day, we still can't find them. What this tells me is that someone has tried to wipe out Bob's background so that fewer people will give him any credibility.
Lazar's first few days at the secret base were spent reading briefing documents whilst under guard. These made clear that the government possessed detailed knowledge of the aliens. It was clear that the spacecraft was not a recent acquisition. It, it seemed like they had been working on it for at least a couple of years, but it could have been 20 for all I know. Once when I went in the hangar, all the bay doors were open all the way down and you can see that there were other crafts in there and they were all completely different. Now I was told that all the power sources and propulsion systems were identical in them. As far as how many of them were operational, I only know the one that I worked on was operational. The rest of them, for, uh, for all I know, could have been cardboard mock-ups, so I really can't even comment on them. One of the crafts looked like it had been stood up on end and a projectile fired through it. Uh, so I would imagine some of these crafts were non-functional. There were nine flying saucers or flying disks all together. George Knapp persuaded his TV station to put Bob Lazar through a polygraph test, a lie detector. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had actually seen anti-gravity propulsion in operation? One of the investigators is still shaken by what he heard. I was looking for all the little sign, the body language, if you will. There was tremendously positive eye contact. There was no fidgeting around, and uh, he never deviated. We covered it several different ways. I asked the same question several different ways, and his answers were always the same. Hooking him up, going through the test, then started the emotional roller coaster that I experienced that night. And it's something that uh, I can honestly say has changed my whole outlook on things. We started the first test, and it went exactly the way I thought it might. He was not doing well. He was uh, reacting uh, to the relevant questions more than he was to the control type of questions, which is indicative of a person who is deceptive because it's showing an emotion that he does not feel comfortable with his answers. These questions bother him. It was basically, uh, have you ever observed a saucer-shaped craft fly out at Area 51? And that was asked, uh, I think, two or three different times. Uh, the second chart we ran was on another question that dealing with uh, the gravity amplifier or an antimatter reactor as part of the powertrain. Uh, about halfway through that test, I'm looking down, and all of a sudden the realization sets in that I'm looking at a probable, truthful, uh, result and I mean I'm getting chills right now talking about it because that's what I got Bob Lazar appeared to be truthful when he described how the craft's reactor functioned we weren't precisely sure how everything worked but we had a rough idea starting from the reactor it reacted an extremely heavy element but stable that isn't found on earth and we placed it on the periodic chart as element 115 this provided the basic gravity wave and electrical power to run the craft. The gravity amplifiers that were located in the craft amplified that wave. And it was phase shifted, in other words, put out of sync. And that was expelled from the bottom of the craft. And the Earth and all matter puts out its own gravity wave. And this put out a wave that was an opposite to it and caused lift. In other words, it wasn't squirting out fire, exhaust, compressed air, or anything that we would imagine would propel something. It was a field propulsion system. It was um, something you really couldn't sense, but would lift the craft. Field propulsion can be demonstrated with two magnets. Set one way, the magnet's poles will attract. Set the other way, the magnets will repel each other. Lazar says that the craft used gravity waves to repel and attract through space. Using earthly materials and state-of-the-art technology, we could not possibly duplicate one of these systems. Not even close. What we're seeing was a, a, a total annihilation reactor, a reactor that reacted matter and antimatter 
which is something we really haven't even touched on. We know this is possible. Uh, we know we have fission reactors. We're currently trying to develop fusion reactors that produce energy like the sun does, but uh, we haven't even thought about working on antimatter reactors, which is 100% uh, efficient. And here was a working model of it, not just a working model of it, but it was small. It was something that a person could lift. And we're looking at something that you can hold in your hand and puts out more power than our full-size nuclear power plants. So this wasn't just a little bit advanced from our technology. This was, this was something big.